History never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. And that is really something that holds true to the subject that I'm going to be discussing today and is one that is related to quite a number of other segments I've done. But as of October 7th of 2023, it has ramped up so much so that I actually have a backlog of content from up to at least six months ago that I have to put on the shelf at the moment, which I've been busy, by the way, very quick side note with relocating, traveling a little bit over the summer with my girlfriend and just getting adjusted to life as I'm figuring things out as I'm about to turn 27 in a few days and have quite a number of things going on, including a marriage and some other stuff, which I could talk about when it comes to personal things in another segment, unrelated, but just wanted to give that little highlight as a notice for why I'm actually publishing this before anything else. And this for sure is going to be worth putting the other stuff to the side because this is quite possibly, as it's still an ongoing development, one of the most important things to come out of the Middle East for the entire 2020s so far. And that is what some are describing as a third intifada, which is also known right now, but I'm sure it's going to be named something more apt, the October 2023 Gaza-Israel conflict. And here I actually have an article from the Associated Press, which I'll link in the description below, whether you're listening to this on a podcasting platform like Spotify, or if you're tuning in on YouTube via video, I'll have both out as well as a backlog of other things very soon. But for this segment, before I give my analysis of what's going on, I'm trying to predict with obviously no one, no approximate degree of certainty, but with the best of my understanding of the events, as well as with the context of the broader historical trajectory of what's going on when it comes to Middle Eastern geopolitics more broadly, as well as just the fact that there's just a lot of information we're getting from just what's been going on in that region even before all of this with the attempted Abraham Accords under Trump that I never really got into as much with the obvious Cold War between Israel and Iran or Saudi Arabia and Iran and some other things going on in the region, not to mention the conflict in Syria and other things interrelated. I mean, there's so much to talk about in this region, and I've touched upon it in other segments, but just to get to the article now, and I'll extrapolate more, as I just wanted to let you guys know that this is something that is very significant and has a lot of moving parts to it, and understanding this type of event requires the zoom back a little bit also and look at other interrelated events and not just assess what's going on right now but also the build-up which we'll get to and have gotten to in the past i'll link also the just really quick videos and segments i've done on israel palestine which is ever since the 1947 events following world war ii and to this present moment an ongoing affair that is one of the most hotly contested among those within the field of international relation and even just casual observers. You don't have to be an Israeli Jew or a Palestinian Arab to have an interest in this type of thing, as someone like myself, who is an American here, has quite a significant interest in terms of just my personal uh, understanding of what's going on here and just my position as someone who's politically conscious and trying to engage into the best of my civic ability and have as much of an accurate understanding as you know, clearly my interpretation of things as an outside observer is you know, limited in some ways, but I'll have this article here and provide you with my two cents for what it's worth thereafter. And it's titled, Hamas Surprise Attack Out of Gaza Stuns Israel and Leaves Hundreds Dead in Fighting Retaliation. And this is by Joseph Fetterman and Isam Adwan. And it's been updated. This story is developing. So by the time I have this out and available for you all to tune into regards to the platform, it might need to be revisited when it comes to the article and the story more broadly. And I'll definitely talk about it in future segments as well. It'll definitely require revisiting. And I have this been, you know, talking about this segment for quite a while now and other, just like the broader conflict. And now let's get to this particular part of it, which is obviously a recent development. And it comes from Jerusalem AP. Backed by a barrage of rockets, dozens of Hamas militants broke out of the blockaded Gaza Strip and into nearby Israeli towns, killing dozens and abducting others in an unprecedented surprise early morning attack during a major Jewish holiday Saturday. A stunned Israel launched airstrikes in Gaza, with its prime minister saying the country is now at war with Hamas and vowing to inflict an, quote, unprecedented price, end quote. In an assault 
of startling breath, Hamas gunmen rolled into as many as 22 locations outside the Gaza Strip, including towns and other communities as far as 15 miles, or 24 kilometers, from the Gaza border. In some places, they roamed for hours, gunning down civilians and soldiers as Israel's military scrambled to muster a response. Gun battles continued well after nightfall, and militants held hostages and standoffs in two towns and occupied a police station in a third. Israeli media, citing rescue service officials, said at least 250 people were killed and 1,500 wounded, making it the deadliest attack in Israel in decades. At least 232 people in the Gaza Strip had been killed and at least 1,700 wounded in Israeli strikes, the Palestinian Health Ministry said. Hamas fighters took an unknown number of civilians and soldiers captured into Gaza, a deeply sensitive issue for Israel, in harrowing scenes posted on social media videos. The conflict threatened to escalate to an even deadlier stage with Israel's vows of greater retaliation. Previous conflicts between Israel and Gaza's Hamas rulers brought widespread death and destruction in Gaza and days of rocket fire on Israeli towns. The situation is potentially more volatile now, with Israel's far-right government stung by the security breach and with Palestinians in despair over a never-ending occupation in the West Bank and a suffocating blockade of Gaza. In a televised address Saturday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who earlier declared Israel to be at war, said the military will use all of its strength to destroy Hamas's capabilities and, quote, take revenge for this black day, end quote. But he warned, quote, this war will take time. It will be difficult, end quote. Quote, all the places that Hamas hides in, operates from, we will turn them into ruins, end quote. He added, quote, get out of there now, end quote, he told Gaza residents, who have no way to leave the tiny, overcrowded Mediterranean territory of 2.3 million people. After nightfall, Israeli airstrikes in Gaza intensified, flattening several residential buildings and giant explosions, including a 14-story tower that held dozens of apartments, as well as Hamas's offices in central Gaza City. Israeli forces fired a warning just before, and there were no reports of casualties. Soon after, a Hamas rocket barrage into central Israel hit four cities, including Tel Aviv and a nearby suburb, where two people were seriously injured. Throughout the day, Hamas fired more than 3,500 rockets, the Israeli military said. In the southern Gaza city of Rafa, an Israeli airstrike late Saturday flattened a home, killing 12 members of the Abu Koto family, neighbors said. Ten members of a family in the northern town of Jebela were killed in another airstrike, relatives said. It was not known why the homes were targeted. The strength, sophistication, and timing of the Saturday morning attack shocked Israelis. Hamas fighters used explosives to break through the border fence enclosing Gaza, then crossed with motorcycles, pickup trucks, paragliders, and speedboats on the coast without resistance from the military. In some towns, a trail of civilians' bodies lay where they had encountered the advancing gunmen. On the road outside the town of Sirt, a bloodied woman slumped dead in the seat of her car. At least nine people gunned down at a bus shelter in the town were laid out on structures on the street, their bags still on the curb nearby. One woman, Screaming, embraced the body of a family member, sprawled under a sheet next to a topped motorcycle. As she was led away, she picked up the dead person's helmet from the ground nearby. In amateur video, hundreds of terrified young people who had been dancing at a rave fled for their lives after Hamas militants entered the area and began firing at them. Israeli media said dozens of people were killed. Associated press photos showed an abducted elderly Israeli woman being brought back into Gaza on a golf cart by Hamas gunmen and another woman squeezed between two fighters on a motorcycle. Images also showed fighters parading captured Israeli military vehicles through Gaza streets. Among the dead in Israel was Colonel Jonathan Steinberg, a senior officer who commanded the military's Nahal Brigade, a prominent infantry unit. The shadowy leader of Hamas's military wing, 
Mohammed Daif, said the assault was in response to the 16-year blockade of Gaza. Israeli raids inside West Bank cities over the past year, violence at Al-Aqsa, the disputed Jerusalem holy site, sacred to Jews as the Temple Mount, increasingly attacked by settlers, increasing attacks on settlers, or by settlers, my bad, on Palestinians, and growth of settlements. Quote, enough is enough, end quote, Dave, who did not appear in public, said in a recorded message. He said the attack was only the start of what he called, quote unquote, the operation Al-Aqsa storm, and called on Palestinians from East Jerusalem to North Israel to join the fight. Quote, today the people are regaining their revolution, end quote. The Hamas incursion on Simchat Torah, a normally joyous day when Jews complete the annual cycle of reading the Torah scroll, revived painful memories of the 1973 Mideast War, practically 50 years to the day in which Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, aiming to take back Israeli-occupied territories. Minor side note, for Egypt, that would have been the Sinai Peninsula, and for Syria, that would have been the still-contested Golan Heights, which the former was actually in a treaty afterwards, I think in 79, actually uh, given back to Egypt under certain stipulations, and the latter is still disputed to this day between Syria and Israel. But back to the article. Comparisons to one of the most traumatic moments in Israeli history sharpened criticism of Netanyahu and his far-right allies, who had campaigned on a more aggressive action against threats from Gaza. Political commentators lambasted the government and military over its failure to anticipate what appeared to be a Hamas attack unseen in its level of planning and coordination. Asked by reporters how Hamas had managed to catch the army off guard, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht an Israeli army spokesperson replied, quote, that's a good question, end quote. The abduction of Israeli civilians and soldiers also raised a particularly thorny issue for Israel, which has a history of making heavily lopsided exchanges to bring captive Israelis home. Hamas's military wing claimed it was holding dozens of Israeli soldiers captive in, quote, safe places, end quote, and tunnels in the Gaza Strip. Hecht confirmed that a number of Israelis were abducted, but would not give a figure, saying only that the number was, quote-unquote, substantial. If true, the claim could set the stage for complicated negotiations on a swap with Israel, which is holding thousands of Palestinians in its prisons. An unknown number of civilians were also taken. AP journalists saw four taken from the kibbutz of Kafa Aza, including two women. In Gaza, a black jeep pulled to a stop and when the rear door opened, a young Israeli stumbled out, an Israeli woman stumbled out, my bad, bleeding from the head and with their hands tied behind her back. A man waving a gun in the air grabbed her by the hair and pushed her into the vehicle's back seat. Israeli TV reported that workers from Thailand and the Philippines were also among the captives. In the kibbutz of Nahal Oz, just 4 kilometers or 2.5 miles from the Gaza Strip, Terrified residents who were huddled indoors said they could hear constant gunfire echoing off the buildings as firefights continued. Quote, With rockets, we somehow feel safer, knowing that we have the Iron Dome missile defense system and our safe rooms. But knowing that terrorists are walking around communities is a different kind of fear, end quote, said Miriam Regin, a 42-year-old volunteer firefighter and mother of three. Earlier in the day, Netanyahu vowed that Hamas, quote, will pay an unprecedented price, end quote. A major question now was whether Israel will launch a ground assault into Gaza, a move that in the past has brought intensified casualties. Israel's military was bringing four divisions of troops, as well as tanks, to the Gaza border, joining 31 battalions already in the area, the spokesperson Hagiri said. And the Israel... Israeli military later released an Arabic language video warning Gazans to leave their homes in targeted areas of the dense coastal enclave. In Gaza, much of the population was thrown into darkness after nightfall as electrical supplies from Israel, which supplies almost all the territory's power, were cut off. Netanyahu's office said in a statement that Israel would stop supplying electricity, fuel, and goods to Gaza. Hamas said it had planned for a potentially long fight. 
Quote, we are prepared for all options, including all-out war, end quote, the deputy head of the Hamas political bureau, Salah al aruri told Al Jazeera TV. Quote, we are ready to do whatever is necessary for the dignity and freedom of our people, end quote. U.S. President Joe Biden said from the White House that he had spoken with Netanyahu to say the United States, quote, stands with the people of Israel in the face of these terrorist assaults. Israel has the right to defend itself and its people, full stop, end quote. Saudi Arabia, which has been in talks with the U.S. about normalizing relations with Israel, called on both sides to exercise restraint. The kingdom said it had repeatedly warned about the danger of, quote, the situation exploding as a result of the continued occupation of the land and the Palestinian people being deprived of their legitimate rights, end quote. Lebanon's Hezbollah militants group congratulated Hamas, praising the attack as a response to, quote, Israeli crimes, end quote. The said the group said its command in Lebanon was in contact with Hamas about the operation. The attack comes at a time of historic division within Israel over Netanyahu's proposal to overhaul the judiciary. Mass protest over the plan has sent hundreds of thousands of Israeli demonstrators into the streets and prompted hundreds of military reservists to avoid volunteer duty. Turmoil that has raised fears over the military's battlefield readiness. It also comes at a time of mounting tensions between Israel and the Palestinians, with the peace process effectively being dead for years. Over the past year, Israel's far-right government has ramped up settlement construction in the occupied West Bank. Israeli settler violence has displaced hundreds of Palestinians there, and tensions have flared around a flashpoint Jerusalem holy site. Palestinians demonstrated in towns and cities around the West Bank on Saturday night amid the offensive from Gaza and Israeli retaliation. Palestinian health officials said Israel fired Israelis fired, killed, uh, yeah, Israeli fire, my bad, killed five there, but gave few details. And that is the end of the article so far. I will link it below. It might be updated by the time you tune into this, and I recommend you read it for yourself. Don't take my word just for about anything. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, you can appreciate my analysis independently for what it is, but if it wasn't for these types of publications giving these concise and as accurate giving the circumstances at the moment as possible from the best of their ability, uh, sort of, you know, insights on what's going on over on the ground, as I am definitely reporting this, you know, far away over here in what is today rainy New York City, but at least the weather was pretty nice for the last couple of weeks as I've been here for just a little bit. But, and I usually record over in Tampa, but today I also wanted to now get into my analysis because that is the article itself and there's a lot to dive into. Some of it was mentioned in the article and I also wanted just to add my own additional perspective from what I've read in other sources and my understanding of the region as a whole and the other times I've discussed these issues, not the ongoing conflict, but the broader situation that has been going on post-1947 with the formation of the State of Israel and what the Palestinians would describe for them, the Nakba or catastrophe. You know, it's a sort of situation where one person's victory is another person's defeat. And the reason I originally stated the original quote from the beginning, which was attributed to the famous author Mark Twain, who I actually read his book, Tom Sawyer, way back when, and I could give a review of that in and of itself. It was a good piece of historic literature and of realistic fiction. But that aside, uh, I think that quote, which is attributed to him, but some people say it might have come from somewhere else, I think is especially uh, something that we should be un uh, keeping in mind, or I guess, uh, what's the right term, my bad? Uh, something that is extremely apt or appropriate, considering that almost 50 years to the date, marked the, as the article stated, Yom Kippur War that happened in 1973, which saw Syria at the time led by Hafez al-Assad, the f late father of the current president, Bashar al-Assad, as well as, I believe, Egypt under what was, I think, Gamal Abdel Nasser? I think, yes, 1973. Or was it Sadat? Uh, 1973, Israel, Egypt. Let's see. It was, I think, actually. Yeah, I just want to double check to make sure I'm correct here. Don't get this wrong. No, yeah, actually, it was Anwar Sadat by that time. Uh, Nasser, I think, a few years before that had uh, passed away. But just wanted to make sure that was correct. But this situation is happening with 50 years almost to that date. 
and the situation going on is obviously a consequence of what has effectively been an unresolved uh, dispute, which is, I mean, not exactly one for one, but it coincides even with the Korean War and the unresolved dispute between the North and the South, the South being my homeland and uh, the part of Korea that I'm from, just a brief side note, but uh, when it comes to uh, even the Taiwan-China situation, or even what's going on in Ukraine and Russia prior to the 2022 outbreak of the full-scale invasion on the part of Moscow, I think these things, at least not one for one, show, and there's other examples too, what happens when there's conflicts that are sort of frozen and they simmer on, and there's sort of uh, moments where they heat up abruptly. And this is definitely one of those times with some describing this actually as the third intifada. And from what I actually even read, there even could be someone as high ranking, because they mentioned a colonel, but a general actually within the Israeli military, a certain Nimrod Aloni, who I've read was actually might, this hasn't been confirmed yet by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, but he could have been the highest ranking prisoner taken by the Palestinians. There's been pictures circulating on social media, but no confirmations yet of him potentially being apprehended by Palestinian militants. And I definitely want to get into in one moment, considering that I think the prisoner swap situation is definitely something that will be a dynamic that should be uh, kept up with and looked at going forward. But the broader sort of impact, when it, especially when it comes to America and Joe Biden, I mean, up until very recently, has been very cool with our cool in the sense not of uh oh man he's cool but no cool in the sense of like not really warm relations and relative to trump or the, even the republicans as a whole biden and the democrats especially have been sort of having a more lukewarm approach i mean he's still i think at the end of the day when the chips are settled and what you can see at the moment pro uh, israel as the u.s i think it's sort of a has been a bipartisan consensus for better and for worse I am somebody who is not really necessarily pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. I try to be pro-America here, and I think that we should try to be involved in creating some sort of equilibrium, not going into the extreme of where Iran is trying to, quote-unquote, wipe Israel off the face of the map. I think they have a right to exist, but I do think on some level so do the Palestinians, and there should be some sort of situation where they could coexist, as they had been able to do under the Ottomans and prior to that. I think we can try to figure something out, and the U.S. should be able to leverage the fact that it is the largest foreign aid provider for not just Israel and also as well as Egypt, and it was at least at, up until recently the sole uh, global hegemon when it comes to being a superpower. And I think that that's you know for better or for worse something that America should try to leverage and learn from the mistakes of what has gone on in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Libya when it came to the U.S.'s role. And it's complicated. I can get into those topics in and of themselves, and they are sort of interrelated with this. But I think overall, when it comes to what's going on here, I think the prisoner shop will be something that definitely, as I mentioned before, keep an eye on. But seeing how Biden and the White House responds to this and policymakers as a whole in Washington is something that will, I think, I think there'll be this sort of more conversation. It's not going to be as Trump like some sort of social media blustering, but instead Biden will sort of, at least in the public, sort of tacitly try to uh, condemn the violence on both sides but ultimately and i think but that will lean towards obviously sort of a more pro israeli uh leaning but clearly obviously considering that whether you're talking about the saudis which were mentioned in the article which i think are topping it out themselves i'm not going to dive into that whole can of worms because i'm i consider myself a huge critic of mbs mohammed bin salman and the house of Saudi as a whole but keeping their role aside and just understanding what what's going on, because they are important for sure. So, so is Iran and, to a lesser extent, Turkey in this situation. And I think when it comes to what's going on over there, and even the Emirate and the, the Gulf states as a whole, where they're talking about, obviously, as I just mentioned, UAE, but also Qatar, which Al Jazeera is the station that they uh, is from actually there. And they actually do pretty relatively decent reporting. I've actually deferred to them on a few issues. I understand there's biases in every publication. That's why I tell you to take things with a grain of salt. But when it comes to especially Middle Eastern affairs, as long as you're not asking about what their opinions are on Qatar and their Monarch, medieval monarchical system, most likely, as contradictory as it usually is when it comes to their coverage and their disposition. I think that Al Jazeera as a whole does do some pretty phenomenal reporting for what it's worth, all things considered. But when it comes to the situation with all these different moving parts that are these various regional players, this is something that obviously could 
leak out and become a wider regional issue. There's already been simmering tensions going on, I think, in Syria with renewal, renewed uh, unrest in the last few months. Uh, I know Assad recently visited Xi in China during the beginning of the Asian Games being hosted in not Beijing, but I think a region in southern China that's probably closer to get to from Syria, I think, by flight. And I think all these other Asian countries. I know there was a, con- a controversy with the Korean uh, sports players not shaking hands with the Chinese ones. We could get into that in another segment, but just to highlight that, um, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world of diplomacy. And I think that the Middle East, especially in the wake of the ongoing situation in Ukraine and the heightened tensions between the U.S., when it comes to China and the situation with the Republic of China on Taiwan, the ROC, we've seen that the Middle East is increasingly being put into a sort of tertiary theater. And I've went to a few international relations conferences. I had the privilege of going to them when I was in Tampa back in the spring and last winter in 2022. And from what I've understood from going to some of these and just keeping up with international relations, the Middle East is going to continue to be in an area of significant strategic importance for better and for worse for the U.S. And I think there'll be possibilities in the future, especially I asked a question regarding nuclear fusion. I think there'll be factors that maybe in the future, especially including the other major conflicts and potential areas of dispute between other powers like Russia and China farther afield that will maybe reduce the Middle East importance. But moments like these that will definitely cause renewed investment of time and interest for Washington and America, for better and for worse, especially considering that Israel has a security guarantee, much similar to Korea or Japan, as well as Germany and those within the NATO countries, NATO bloc. I mean, Germany's in that, but other NATO countries, I mean, Korea and Japan aren't. But when it comes to the situation there, that is something that I think is going to definitely impact how things are going on in the future. But I do think that right now we should be aware of the fact that this situation is fluid and there is just so much happening on the ground at the moment. I've given you my analysis based off of what I understand so far, but I'm definitely going to have to come back to this in the future. And especially considering the fate of that general uh, Aloni and as well as what is going to go. I think that just from what I can see so far, and this will be, I think, the last of my analysis at the moment, considering that I'll definitely have to come back to this sometime soon, as this is still going on. I think that this will ultimately come out as more of a political and strategic victory on Hamas, being able to have obviously pulled a sort of sucker punch or fast one on Israel. And despite their Iron Dome being gifted by us and a lot of other gear that really makes them one of the most powerful military. And they're also a sort of, I mean, when it comes to uh, the closest thing to a Silicon Valley outside of the US, other than Shenzhen in China, maybe. And I think that that even is not even close, exactly a one for one. Silicon Valley still reigns supreme, I think, in the tech startup ecosystem as somebody who's had experience working in that system and has had the privilege to visit California in the past. But when it comes to uh, Israel with Tel Aviv, they have actually been known as a significant technology startup hub and with uh, other sorts of things beyond just the sort of consumer goods. There's also been the that's, I think, the place where the surveillance technology Pegasus for Better Forest comes from. And there's a lot of stuff coming out from there that's pretty sophisticated. And one of the reasons why in an unrelated conflict, conflict not too far away in the Caucasus region, why Azerbaijan has been able in the last decades been able to just recently, and I'll get into it in another segment, I had it on a backlog, decisively settle, it seems like, the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute between Armenia regarding the self-proclaimed independent Republic of Arksa, which was at least internationally recognized Azerbaijani territory, despite having an ethnic Armenian population that could date its uh, presence in that region for thousands of years prior. But, you know, that sort of situation was largely due to the fact that Turkey, as well as Israel, were major contributors towards the upgrade of the Azerbaijani military due to the fact that they're a major petroleum exporter and uh, were able to leverage the funds that they got from that to upgrade themselves. And it just goes to show, I mean, you have so many conflicts now, not even too far afield, Ukraine, Eastern Europe, you have the Azerbaijan-Armenian conflict, and then you even have the situation now with Israel and Palestine, which has always been something that's been simmering. And even in the last few decades, you saw that there were times, even as back, far back as 2006, and in, I think, 2014, where there's been upticks in conflict. But right now, it seems like even compared to those, this might really be a, for even relative to that, a pretty huge one proportionally and is going to be something that the aftermath of which is still going to have to be discussed and 
uh, conjectured upon in future segments, not just by myself, but other observers, both the layman and professional alike, because this sort of thing, what happens in the Middle East, I mean, an area like, for example, Gaza, just a brief side note to finally wrap all this up as just to provide some historical context. And I've talked about, and for the sake of brevity, the foundation of Israel and the sort of disputed nature of what's been going on and the Cold War between other factions such as between America and Iran or America and Russia vis-a-vis Syria or even the situation when it comes to Saudi Arabia and Iran in the situation that's going on in Yemen and America is involved in that as well. There's a lot of proxy conflicts and the Middle East also not just in contemporary times but historically going as far back as antiquity and there before has been the site of a arena essentially geopolitically for the superpowers of the day whether it was the Achaemenid Persians the Macedonians under Alexander the Great or even the Romans or later the East Romans which are known today as more so the Byzantine Greeks at least in the West I mean there's been a revision of that there I think when it comes to continuity still Romans essentially but culturally a little bit you know you could argue with Christianity and the Greek speaking nature in the 7th century that I mean, we could get into all of that, and I've talked about another stuff uh, segment. It's an interesting thing, but you saw the Romans of that time versus the Sasanian Persians just fighting over that region with their proxy states, the Ghassanids and the Lachmids, over supremacy in that area, which is a major sort of uh, juncture geographically where the major trade routes between Europe, Asia, and Africa converge. And looking, at, for example, at the Sinai Peninsula, which connects North Africa to the West Asian area that is known as the Middle East or was back in ancient times known as the Near East, you see that there is a lot at stake geographically. And Gaza, for example, was actually even a Hellenized city after Alexander and his successors had rolled through and conquered the Achaemenid Persians holdings, which they had previously conquered from uh, the Egyptians and others who came before, such as the Assyrians and the Babylonians, et cetera, et cetera. But just to go just to show how this area really has been, at least uh, when you think of the Sumerians or Mesopotamia, a one of the cradles of civilization and also a cradle for conflict. It seems like, if anything, geographically, this area, as much as it's been gifted with being a sort of melting pot of an economic uh, heart for many uh, different empires, both new and old, it's also been cursed, at least when it comes to its population, for having to deal with the whether it be the Black Death or the Plague of Justinian, as well as the different migrating tribes or the situation with the Mongols and what they did with Iraq. And, you know, all these different things that just go to show that your location can be both a blessing and a curse. And I'm sure people from this region could tell you that and are no strangers to that sort of situation. But when it came to Gaza, which actually was part of a broader region known as Koli, Syria, it was disputed actually even between Alexander's successors, the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids who ruled over Syria and then previously in Mesopotamia, but effectively over time it just was really Syria. And Gaza today, as some have described as an open air prison and has been blockaded ever since 79, where the US has agreed to provide foreign aid to Egypt and help, uh, sort of as a way to, I mean, some could argue to bribe. I mean, bribery happens regardless if you're the US, China, Russia. I mean, if you're a great power, money is going to be used in other resources, such as economic uh, resources, trade deals, etc., to leverage them as a way to come to settlements and advance different political interests. I mean, for better and for worse, again. But after Egypt had decided to no longer have a significant beef with Israel, as it had been, I mean, one of the major players in all of its previous conflicts, as Israel was a fledgling country post-1947 and had to deal with the different conflicts, whether it's the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, or even the situation going on right now. And ever since that time with Egypt, where they were able to, in exchange for giving the Sinai Peninsula back, as well as the foreign aid, with on the side of America, with I think Egypt being the second largest receiver of foreign aid, which we can get into in another discussion. Some are against this idea of foreign aid. I used to be like that as a libertarian, but I've realized that and maybe we could adjust the policy somewhat and leverage it to incentivize certain parties to act in ways that are more amenable to U.S. interest and interest of preserving peace as a whole, which is at least my personal goal as far as it can be achieved within reason. Not a piece where people are, you know, stepped on. I mean, we can even get into Ukraine and my issues with some people who are more in favor of this "quote unquote" negotiated settlement, which I think is a false misnomer. Which we can get into another segment. 
as I think there's some relation between that and what's going on and all these different things happening across the world. I mean, there's even stuff going on in Myanmar farther afield. There has nothing to do with this, but I mean, maybe a little bit tangentially since Russia is involved to an extent, but we can get into that in another segment. And I think that when it comes to this, though, to keep in mind, this situation is fluid. It's changing, as I mentioned before. And just to not you know, take anything that anyone says in particular with a grain of salt, but confer to multiple resources and keep an open mind to these things because I think that things are far more complicated than they always seem on face value. And when it comes to the situation involving, I think, this area, Palestine in particular, you're going to see, I think, Israel do a counterstrike. And I think as history is any indicator, I think that they have a significant amount of power and firepower to be able to do something decisive, if not extremely controversial. And what goes on in the U.S. election, I think in 2024 in particular, depending on who, which party is able to pull off a win. And as far off, and as someone who isn't a fan of Trump, I just want to give my opinion out there as someone who predicted in 2015 that Trump was going to win, unfortunately, for better and for worse. I didn't vote for him in either of these elections, but I do understand as a sort of figure in domestic politics, this sort of cult of personality around him. And it'll be worth a discussion on its own. I do think if he becomes president again, that this could potentially give a green light, especially in the lieu of the recent judicial crisis in Israel, for them to maybe just do a full out uh, wiping out of the Gaza Strip and maybe even go as far as pushing in the U.S. Bank as this would serve as a pretext, I guess, as solid enough as anyone would be from the vantage point of Israel. And as someone who would like to see the Palestinian Arabs and Israelis Jews be able to coexist as long as well as well as with the Samaritans and other peoples of this area, as this has area is an area where people have been able to coalesce and there's been multi ethnic populations coexisting there for centuries, seemingly time and memoriam. I know there's been flare up of conflicts, but I think at least, especially being in the 21st century, it would be nice if America could f serve as a force for good to try to be a mediator, or at least on the side of trying to mitigate this. And I think that for better and for worse, Biden, I mean, I've been using that phrase a lot, as much criticism as you could give for Afghanistan, some other issues, especially involving the lack of a more coherent national infrastructure plan as someone who I personally am more in favor of a nationwide public infrastructure plan in particular. And I can, again, another segment, these are all things that could be their own particular topics. And I look forward to talking about them. I do think, despite my own reservations on him, I think his response when dealing with Israel in particular has been good so far, but this might definitely shake it up and bring them together. And I know that, I mean, as much as they're not, at least on a personal level, close, Netanyahu or Biden, same as with Obama and Biden, uh, Obama, I mean, not my, my bad, Obama and Netanyahu, I think that this sort of crisis might make them, you know, as they say, politics makes for strange bedfellows. I think it would bring Biden, who's a cold warrior and someone who's typically upheld the former mainstream consensus, which has definitely been changing. I mentioned it before when it comes to the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party. However, despite the growing challenge to what was previously a default sort of consensus, both within the Democratic Party, but still more so, I'd say, within the Republican Party, at least when it comes to the establishment wing. And I think overall, when it comes to Israel, I think we should definitely try to moderate and maybe try to get them to be more amenable to working out some sort of deal with the Palestinians. However, this sort of situation has clearly made that sort of uh, sentiment not viable at the moment, and things seem like they're only looking towards further escalations. Kind of obvious, but I think that this might not just, you know, it might start in Israel and Palestine, but it might not end there. And hopefully it's not some sort of worst case World War Three scenario, but we're going to definitely have to keep up with all this. And I think what definitely makes this sort of thing more complicated, as I mentioned before, is the upcoming 2024 presidential election between Biden and Trump, as it looks like. Maybe, hopefully not, it wouldn't be them, but it looks like it will be them. And depending on who wins, I think it'll make for a situation. I think Trump would basically give a green light for Netanyahu, especially in lieu of the recent judicial reforms that Netanyahu and his coalition were able to ram through. I think they would give them the green light that they were already looking towards to get, have a pretext to completely get rid of the uh, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and West Bank or some sort of thing like that. 
And I think if Biden still wins a second term, which right now I think the current sentiment of the country, unfortunately, I think Trump is poised to look like he's going to win as someone who isn't a fan of him, who predicted he would win in 2015, won a bet in 2016 the night of, which makes for a fascinating story that I'll definitely tell you all. Uh, a good time where I had it with an old friend of mine who we predicted he would win with somebody else at the time. And we had a bet. It's a crazy story, but it just goes to show that I think that sometimes, despite my own personal sentiments, there's certain writing on the wall. And I think that it is consequential and it will impact what's going on after this. But I think that before we even get to 2024, we'll have to see what happens in the coming days and weeks and the response of Israel, which I think will be an all out sort of thing, as they have just said for themselves, as you heard the article that I've read, that they are in a state of war. And you know what they say, all's fair in love and war. I mean, I do think we should try to aspire towards the sort of international framework of the United Nations as far odd as it may be, and as a way to try to create a more just world. But I do think that in times like this, you're seeing how, especially with the UN General Assembly and the US being one of the only main countries on the Security Council there, and the sort of more, sort of more lukewarm situation with Zelensky, with uh, the Congress and the funding for Ukraine, which is something that is another contested issue, which I'll have to get back into. You're seeing that the position of the US and even the post-World War II order, which the UN in some ways symboli uh, symbolizes, which is the headquarter of being not even too far away from where I grew up in New York City. I think that all that stuff right now is under threat and is being challenged and the very legitimacy of these things and co conflicts such as these goes to show is fraying. And I do think the US is gonna have to step up and assert itself in a leadership position, but learn from its mistake that it's made in the past couple of decades. And I think have a more tactful approach here as it's going to need it as this situation looks like it's only set to amp up. And I think that Iran, and as I'll get into another segment, Saudi Arabia, are players you'll have to keep an eye on, as well as the situation with Russia as they were able to consolidate their own presence with Syria vis-a-vis -vis Assad and their strategic base in Tartus and Latakia, giving them access to the Mediterranean, despite the fact that there is a blockade going on between the Bosphorus Straits and the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. But that could get me get into another time. And I do think that if you look at what's going on in Lebanon, there's an ongoing domestic crisis there. I do have a friend actually from there that I have caught up with a couple of times that I just know from that situation over there, it is pretty crazy. And it's unfortunate because this area, as I mentioned before, has been a rich area when it comes to its history and the importance it's had for the world in terms of international commerce and diplomacy, but as well that has brought with it, you know, these varying interests both in the region and further afield that have, in its, their own ways, I think, have led us to this juncture where this crisis looks like it is just going to keep boiling. And there might even be other fact, factions getting involved, as the article mentioned. And we're going to definitely have to get back to this in another segment, but hopefully this so far has highlighted enough of what is happening so that at least at the moment you all have a better understanding of what's going on i know for sure that i have much to learn and have to do more research on this type of thing but i appreciate you all tuning in and also being able to elucidate my current understanding of things through this type of platform but if you did enjoy this please make sure to leave a comment or any other form of feedback check out and follow me on all the other social media sites whether it be my personal handle or the podcast channel or you know the podcast pages as well as if you can be able to consider checking out other segments as well as sharing them with all the people you know, your folks, your friends, associates. And yeah, I know, I mean, I also have the resources that I mentioned, such as the article and other things related to this that will help maybe further give you guys some more and gals uh, some insight on what is going on here, as it is a very complicated thing and it is ongoing as we speak. But for now, this has been Tom, and you've been tuning in to Get Nuanced with TJC, the podcast. I'll catch you all in the next segment I make real soon. For now, stay safe and peace out, as well as, really quick, my hearts and prayers, as, you know, maybe meaningless as that might be. I know a lot of people tend to say that type of stuff to just morally posture. And maybe this is a form of that, just to be transparent. But I genuinely feel, as someone who's a student of history, who keeps up with this stuff, for the innocent Israeli Jews and the Palestinian Arabs, as well as the Samaritans and others who are unfortunately having to have their lives be you know, tragically uh, put to an end or just even inconvenienced, whether it be mildly or through, you know, the conflict itself or just like through the interruption of vital services and being able just to live their lives, something that someone like myself here in the States often can take for granted when it comes to the comfort and security that 
how you know here is something that I've never had to nowhere near have I had to ever deal with something with what is going on right now in Israel and Palestine, let alone other parts of the world. But just with that all being said, please everybody, if you can keep up with all this, and you know, please you know make sure to try to do what you can in your own way to stay up to date and try to contribute productively to this course. And with that, see you all later.